Welcome to Datin Paduka Marina Mahade. I hope you're doing a okay today. What would you like me to to call you? Uh, Datin Marina, Datin. That's my least favorite question. Uh, you can call me Marina. Okay, as long as you're okay with that, we'll um, we'll proceed, okay. I guess. Okay. Um, just keeping the conversation as casual as possible. But the most important thing I'm going to ask you all day is, how are you? I'm okay, I guess. Uh, that's what. I think most of us will answer because otherwise it will it will uh, evolve into a rant. So yeah, I'm fine. Okay, and overall, how how is um how has MCO been for you mentally speaking? How do you keep yourself occupied? Because this is a very subjective question. Every individual will differ in their answer, but for you personally, well, I am very busy. So I don't really mind staying at home. I get a lot done um, at home that I wouldn't uh, be able to do if I had to go out for meetings or uh, other appointments. But yeah, it's it's um, it's all right. I do miss a lot of normal life, but uh, it's been all right for me so far. I'm very happy to hear that, of course. Um, but you said you you don't mind staying at home, but you also have a reputation as a traveler. You visited, I don't know how many countries. I, do you even know how many countries you visited? Uh, I'm sure I do. It's just I've never sat and counted. Um, yes, I, I do miss traveling a great deal. I haven't been on a plane since February 2020. So I forgot what it's like. Um but yeah, that's the one thing I miss most. And, and on top of everything, I run a, a women's travel website. So it always feels a little bit strange to talk about travel when you haven't been traveling anywhere. Yeah. But what, what, why does traveling mean so much to you? Why, you? why do you feel so enriched at times by traveling? Well, you know, um, I think my my parents from young uh, basically uh you know, put it upon us that travel is educational, that you need to see the rest of the world, that the world is not just your your little kampong or, or whatever. There's more out there. And also that there, there are all sorts of different people out there whom we need to know about to understand. So 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 from young I've always viewed uh travel as part of my growing up and part of my um learning and and everything and and that's the way i think everyone should should look at it uh if they have the opportunity but when it comes to traveling uh, i'm sure you've met so many people so many uh inspiring women women that have stories to tell but what are some of the biggest issues or challenges which are currently faced by our education system do you feel from what you've learned from overseas and from what you've gleaned here as well oh you know i I went to study overseas uh, the first time for A-levels. And now, um, recently, I went back again to do my master's. And what I really found is that we are lacking so much in um, critical thinking, in giving our students a really wide base of knowledge, because I found that as an adult, even as a as a master's student, I didn't know so many things that the very young ones in my in my class knew that they knew how to analyze things and and analyze books and make references to this and that, which totally escaped me. So I felt severely handicapped, and and I kept wondering whether other Malaysian students, especially if they go overseas, whether they face this as well. And I did talk to a lot of Malaysian students and, and they said, yeah, that was their biggest problem, knowing how to do the type of analysis that is needed when you respond to a question and, and assignments in class. What about the, the line between debate and discourse? Because Sometimes you find that ideas might be shut down, but there should always be room for debate and discourse. And I, I personally feel at times that's lost in the world. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, over here in our education system, we're often spoon-fed things and we're not really allowed to challenge anything, even if it feels wrong that the, you know, the, the teacher is omnipotent 
And that's really um, makes us unprepared to face the real world out there where people are always going to challenge, where people always will have different opinions. Um, and I, but the trouble is nowadays, there's the other thing going around where if you have a different opinion, you're very likely to be shut down. And I don't mean just in Malaysia, but worldwide, because now there are certain trends in thinking that if you don't conform, you're also uh, likely to be shut down. And, you know, it, it's a very difficult path to tread because I'm very happy that young people nowadays are very woke. They know about climate change. They know about systemic discrimination. They know about injustice here, there, and everywhere. But they're not very nuanced about it sometimes. So if anyone gives a different opinion, then those people get shut down. Whereas inclusivity means a diversity of opinion. So I worry about that a lot. Even as I'm happy that young people are more aware of what's going on in the world today. Where, where in the UK did you study, by the way? I, I went to do my A-levels first uh, in a school in, um, in Suffolk. And then I went to the University of Sussex for my degree in Brighton. Lovely places. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, beautiful place. My sister lived in a town called Lewis, just outside of Brighton. Oh, I know, I know and Lewis. It's down the road. Yeah, bonfire night, November fifth, yes. uh, Guy Fawkes, and all of that. I mean, I, I can really relate to what you're saying, but on my my phase was much younger. I was shipped off to boarding school in the UK when I was eight, eight oh. years old. Oh, you just like my father was. I'm one of those, but. I, I had to find my place there as well because my mum is Malaysian. I I am Malaysian. I'm Asian myself. I was born here in Malaysia, proudly so. So at the time, this was early 90s, maybe people looked at me a little bit funny because it was predominantly white. <laughs> so you, turn, you learn as you go. And um, I value it so much. It is intrinsic to who I am, my education. Do you believe that a good education plays an important role in growing and nurturing a successful individual? Totally, absolutely. You know, uh, good quality education, I think. Not just education, meaning you go to school, you check in at school or you check in at, at university and then you come out and you feel you've done it. But a good quality education, which is in an educational institution at, at the basic, but also from outside, from travel, from reading uh, from talking to other people, I think all of that contributes to your education. And how did your education really help guide you to where you are today? You are you are a bastion of, of truth and justice. You're an icon in that right, where you are now, which is why we're talking to you. Let's be honest here. I, I'm not asking you to toot your own horn. This is just my personal viewpoint. Did you always know you were going to venture into activism and, and social work? Not at all. Not at all. It was not something that I woke up one day and said, I think I'll be an activist for this cause today. Not at all. Um, I I pretty much stumbled into it, really. You know, it, it's part of my life's journey. I was just doing this and that and the other and slowly learning about things that were going on, injustices that were happening, especially to women. And, you know, started really by doing charity work, raising funds for various charities. And then quite by chance, that reputation for fundraising uh, got me invited to sit on, on the board of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation. And before I knew it, they made me chair. And then I really took it on. And, and basically, I have to say that when I first became chair of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation, I knew very little, very little about activism at all. And I had to learn on the job pretty much, you know, and, and I just did. And, and suddenly it was 12 years later. And, uh, you know, AIDS had become a big topic. And I, I hope I, I contributed a lot to, to helping, you know, people get treatment, people get care, poor prevention programs and all that during that time. But yeah, it, it was almost accidental. 
I'm an oh, accidental oh. activist. <laughs> Sometimes the best things happen by accident in life. Absolutely, um, yeah. But because now that you are in a position where you have so much experience as an activist, what do you think it takes to be an activist? I think sincerity, most of all. Sincerity. You really have to believe in the cause that you've taken up. And it doesn't matter which one. You really have to believe in it. And you really have to believe that you can do something for people and not, you know, not be fatalistic, like, oh, what to do, you know? You have to really believe in it. And you also have to believe that what you should be working for um, eventually should not need you anymore. You know, you have to kind of, um, bas basically you have to work for the day when you're not needed anymore because mm. that's the only sign of success to me. If they keep needing you and some people stay on and on and on because they feel like they're always needed, um, it means you haven't succeeded in solving whatever issue. Undoubtedly, some issues take a very long time to get anywhere. But still, that's what you should be looking at. That's, that's your long-term view that I should be working myself into redundancy and then it's a measure of success. Do you ever feel defeated though? Do you ever feel, do you ever wake up certain days thinking it's, it's like a never ending battle? And I don't want to be negative about this, but how do you pick yourself up from that situation? No, I, I always do. It happens a lot. It happens a lot when something doesn't work or, you know, people are unwilling to accept ideas or unwilling to accept change. Yeah, you know, I, I get, you know, disappointed. But then there's always, you know, little bits of change that happen, little bits of positivity that happens that, that gives me hope. And, and I think like, wow, yeah. You know, when I was working in AIDS, when I was started, there was, when I started uh, in the early 90s, there was absolutely no cure, no cure at all. Now, if we believe that that was all that was going to be, then it would have been very difficult. But, you know, you have to trust in human ingenuity, in human innovation, in human passion to want to solve a problem, to know that they'll come up with a solution. And sure enough, we got treatment. And then it was a question of how do we make it cheaper so that more people can have it? And we did that. And, and now people can live with HIV. They don't need to, to die from it, at least not medically. They might die from lack of knowledge or, or you know, lack of access to treatment. But those are easy to solve if you really want to. But the, the initial seemingly intractable problems were gone. So... Yeah, you you have to believe. You have to believe in what you're doing with absolute sincerity. You have to persevere. I think it's amazing how far medicine has come along in, say, the last 150 years, let alone the last 15, 20 years. And oh, in the past I think, year. Don't forget, yes. more than a year ago, we had no vaccines for COVID. Yep, exactly. And, and, and it's the awareness because everyone was aware of COVID. And therefore... <laughs> The, and the great that, minds in the world. By the way, all that builds on on the work that we did on AIDS vaccines, which we still don't have. <laughs> yeah, that must be frustrating on some levels for you, I'm sure. Well, um, well, moving on. This is a slightly silly question, but I have been asked to ask it to you. Does activism pay well? Because if someone wants to do this as a career, you do need money to survive yourself. You do. You do. Um. You can work for NGOs now um, as a viable career. That, that's for sure. And in fact, because we want the best people to come and, and work for us. We really do. We, we need the same skills as any corporate body uh, to do the work, plus the passion and the caring and everything. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, salaries in... 
NGOs uh, are going up. They might not still be in the stratosphere of a, a corporate job, but they are paying decently because we believe in giving people a decent uh, living. So, yeah, there, there are good benefits, you know, in terms of leave and, and things like that. So, yeah, it is worthwhile. And what I keep telling people is that if you work for an NGO, it looks really good on your resume. So even if you leave the NGO world and go into the corporate world, it looks good because you would have learned skills that would help you in your corporate job. And similarly, the other way around, you know, it there's a lot of cross-fertilization of skills that goes on between the NGO world and the corporate world. And yeah, it is possible to survive working uh, in an NGO. That's a perfect segue into my next question, because what, what kind of skills are we talking about here? And how can you train for these skills? Well, first, you have to know your subject. That is the most basic. Nothing is worse than an activist or an advocate for a cause not having all the knowledge about the cause at their fingertips. That's number one, yeah? I, you know, already the passion and all that is great, but it's not enough. You have to know all that. Secondly, I think communication skills is really, really crucial. If you can't tell your story, you can't convince anyone. You can't convince anyone that the cause that you are supporting is important and that they need to support it in, in whatever way, particularly financially. So communication skills is good. Uh, strategic thinking is really important. Knowing which direction to go, what are the priorities that you should be focusing on, um, and, and all sorts of things. In fact, it, it needs the skills that you would need in any other job. Um, the only thing is that you have to be well-versed in the subject, just as you would if you were an accountant or or a scientist or, or anything. Yep. Yeah, most of these uh, knowledge-based skills you would learn at a university. Now, I'm at an age right now where a lot of my friends are having children, and they are starting to think of their children's education even further down the road and, and saving up for it earlier, the better. In fact, even my wife is uh, going back to do her PhD as we're speaking right now. Good so, for her. Yeah, I'm extremely proud of her and the work that she's put in uh, to be an orthodontist. But you yourself as a mother... I mean, how, how do you guide your children through this process? You've, you've probably been through it, experienced it yourself. What advice do you have for parents out there helping their children? What do you want to see in a university? Well, um, look, I grew up with parents who really, really, you know, plays a huge importance on education. And they didn't force us to... to think of a career or whatever from early on. All you had to do was get on that education track, primary school, secondary school, university, and after that, you can do what you want. So there was no pressure on us apart from just doing all those how many years of education and then we were free to do. And I think that's a great attitude that we are not trying to mold children in the way that we... Um, we want them to be. So I, I think it's it's a bit like, you know, you, you put enough pressure for them to, to do well, but not so much pressure that you're going to force them into boxes or into molds that, that uh, you don't, that they are not suited to. Yeah. So, I mean, I used to tell my kids like, look, you know, the better you do, the more choices you have, right? But I can't sit for your exams for you. You have to do it. So to make sure that you do well, then you have to, to study. And, and after that, once you get a good grade, you can do, do what you want. You have the whole world open to you. But if you don't do well, then your choices are very limited. And what young people want nowadays is they want to have a lot of choice. That's a big thing, right? So um, 
unfortunately, they have to go through this uh, school process in order to have that choice. I, I, I have had both types of kids. You know, I've had one daughter that I really had to push um, to do well in school. She's very smart, but she wasn't going to put in the elbow grease unless I pushed her. The other one, I didn't have to do anything. She just thought it through herself, worked out everything herself, and just worked at it and got everything she wants. You know, so, mm. you know, I can see both sides and I can see where our role as parents is to facilitate them to to be their own person, but without compromising, uh, you know, education in the least. Yeah. Nurturing their own values, what, what's important to them. Do you see people that you've known for a long time from a previous generation being pigeonholed into a box to fit a certain stereotype, which they fa- which their family wants rather than what they want to do in life? Is that what you're learning from as well, based on what you've seen? Yeah, you know, when when I was growing up, our choices in Korea are very limited, right? You're either a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, maybe an engineer, and those are mainly for for men. For women, you know, it was even more limited. You you're just not even expected to have a career at all. But I was lucky. I had great role models in my parents. You know, my mom was a doctor herself and she worked throughout her career until until retirement. So I knew that women could go out and work. But now there's a real sea change, you know. There are more girls in our universities and they're going out there to work. You see them everywhere and they're doing all sorts of amazing things. I mean, you know, the things like computer engineer or even a radio host didn't really exist uh, mm. in my time. And now people are doing all sorts of amazing things. Um, they're being entrepreneurs. I'm so amazed at the young people who are setting up their own businesses and doing really unique uh, jobs, unique businesses, which I would never, never have thought of at the time. So, you know, it's a time of great opportunity, but at the base of it is you need to have the type of education, the type of exposure in order to get all these ideas. Um, otherwise, you're kind of stuck. And I think it's it's good to stress the importance for women out there to continue to, to smash the glass ceiling. Now, I can only speak to my own experiences in my field of work, which is radio or was radio. Now I'm, I'm focused more on TV and football, soccer. So I cover the Premier League and the Euros and all of that. And I'm seeing more and more women come into the field, uh, particularly in the UK, where there's a lot of different broadcasters. And it's so great to see. But at the same time, I, I'm not an idiot. I'm well aware there's a lot of people giving negative comments, not because of their opinion, not because of their background, simply because of their gender. And that is the silliest, silliest thing. Even last night, Marina, I was talking to a colleague of mine and she said, oh, I have to go on TV tomorrow to talk about football. It's her first time. I said, you're going to smash it. You know your stuff. You can do it. And she said, yeah, but there's people there because of my gender. I said, so what? This is your opinion. Everybody is entitled to an opinion about a football match, a player, a team, whatever. That's, yeah. that's your, your God-given right. And I want, I'm looking forward to seeing her do it tonight. And I think, am, am I speaking too much about the importance of breaking glass ceilings or is that something that you believe in as well? Oh, totally. I, and I think there still exists a glass ceiling. Um, and, you know, there's so many areas. I mean, I, I, I'm glad to see women, you know, being commentators in sports and all that. I, I watch, there's a woman who's, on the MotoGP thing and she's interviewing the the bikers and things like that and and it's amazing i mean she knows what she's talking about and and it's it's wonderful um and why not you know at 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 heart it's about your knowledge right and from that knowledge you uh base your opinion on something so yeah, I mean, but, you know, in many, many other areas, I mean, in the corporate field, for instance, it's still a, a thinning pyramid where, you know, a lot of women at the bottom and then it gets thinner and thinner at the top. 
and there needs to be more and for me personally my my big thing is women in politics there really isn't enough at the top making real decisions and i think if we if we had more um politics would have a very different face yeah do you look at other countries like new zealand i think is the best example new zealand and- there's finland there's taiwan there there are several countries actually with women leaders and if you see how they've been managing the the covid you can see that there's a correlation between the way they have led and the way the epidemic the pandemic is is managed uh tends to be more human focused yeah and it's i just can't believe we live in a world where some people genuinely want to judge someone based on their creed their color or their gender it's unfathomable Sadly, we still do but i think the fact that it's talked about more now uh points to progress because once upon a time we just took took all this for granted that it should be mm. men who are ruling everything and deciding everything and doing everything and now we are talking about all sorts of other uh, issues and and there's great pushback but the push pushback wouldn't have happened if there was something pushing it forward right but you know what speaking of learning there's so many different ways nowadays to learn now attending school reading books which i think is becoming almost a lost art uh, listening to podcasts when you're driving watching online courses particularly during lockdown and and mco what do you think is the most effective way of learning in this day and age or is it an accumulation of all these things well i think it's it is an accumulation you know i mean a lot of people nowadays are because of social media particularly have very short attention span so they only respond to short videos short articles um that sort of thing but i think that they'll only ever get the gist of everything and and unfortunately to cater to that we are having to boil down issues to the very very simplest forms which is a you know a real pity because one of i was reading a book actually about uh the lost art of conversation i think it's it's called because we don't have very deep conversations anymore because we don't do very deep reading anymore we don't read long articles and that's where the real substance of an issue is um not the very very short bursts of information that we get So you know I think that we should be doing um a combination of things if we can we should really be encouraging reading and and we should really be encouraging talking talking to people face to face even if it's across you know um the internet like we are here but because w- when you just text again A, you are boiling things down to the most most basic and secondly you are often editing yourself so you are preventing yourself from saying something that might might get a negative reaction from someone so you're censoring yourself and so you're living in a world where everyone agrees and if everyone agrees you never learn anything you never mm. learn a different point of view that that's the basis of this book which is really good sherry turkel is the author and and she really is advocating against texting so much you know which unfortunately even i do it all the time um but it has a very long term effect uh particularly on young people in the depth of the knowledge that they have so i think that's the problem with you know wokeness nowadays which is great on the one hand but also tends to be not nuanced at all because the reacting to this very very small bit of information and not looking at the depth of it yeah and on that topic i discuss this often with friends i try to fill any social media feed that i have with 
differing opinions because otherwise it would become an echo chamber. And I think there's too much of that going around of a lot of people where if you're more left inclined, then it's only the left you hear. You don't hear, like you were mentioning, having different ideas and, and, and this discourse about it. And same for the right wing and too much of the right wing. You know, it's there has to be a balance. And I think that's where universities are also important because from my experience and all my friends, universities have always encourage this, encourage this discourse. And sometimes it's good a way to step away from the online world and actually face-to-face learning totally. institutions or otherwise. Totally. I mean, it, it's become endemic, you know, there's not having face-to-face conversations. And in fact, sometimes people are at the same table and they're all on their phones. They're not talking to each other. Or sometimes they're talking to each other, but only on the phone. And that's that's really bad. That's been the, the most major change in human behavior, I think, in the past decade or so. And it, it really changes the way humans interact with one another, which I don't think are really good um good uh is is a good thing at all. But in terms of you know having different opinions, I think you also have to make judgments about opinions that are different from yours. If there's substance to it, then that's okay. But if it's the sort that is just throwing things out mm. or creating false um, false narratives and all that, I don't think that you have to cater to those at all. In times of adversity, what skills do you lean on? What do you think the youth should build on today? Because as an activist, I'm sure you face a lot of brickbats. I'm sure you face a lot of criticism, negative stuff being said about you, either behind your back or to your face even. Well, I yeah, I do face uh, a lot of um, criticism, but basically I ignore them. I, I don't spend my time. I don't need to, you know, to poison my days with, negativity like that so i tend not to to read you know bad comments and all that although sometimes people you know send them to me and say have you seen this what are you going to do about it and i say nothing and you know i really don't believe in feeding the trolls mm. because they they love it if you give them attention so i don't bother um i got too many things to do to to worry about what what people say and i think if you are doing things out of principle if you got a clear conscience then you know you should just carry on that's great advice to have i also want to ask a couple of questions about your own personal projects like um you launched the figure as a yes. platform for women to have a, a safe space to share their travel tips and stories so what inspired this idea to to jump start this community well, um, it was a very practical idea, actually, because in the days when I used to travel a, a lot for work, and because I, I was doing NGO work, I was being sent to all sorts of places, not the usual tourist spots. And the one question that women tend to ask, uh, which I think men don't have to think about so much, is what do we wear? I mean, mm. what is acceptable in those places? Do we have to cover our heads? You know, can we wear short sleeves? Do we shake hands with people? All these sorts of things. So I was looking around and I couldn't find the information. So I thought, well, there's a need here. There's a gap here. And I thought a website would be good. And I didn't know how to do one. And I just kept talking about it because I'm quite happy if someone else does it. Uh, because, you know, it's about the need. And finally, I, I met someone who said, yeah, we can do it. And we did it. So 2014, we launched zafigo.com, uh, a site where we hope women who travel or want to travel can look for, for information about where to go, how to go safely, smoothly, successfully, and all that. And you know, it's one of those cases where when you build it, the people come. And, and we found so many women who've had wonderful experiences traveling and not so wonderful one, but all willing to talk about it. So here we are, you know, seven years later. 
Mm. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is Indeed. certainly power. Totally, totally. But of course, uh, the elephant in the room is the pandemic, stopping traveling across the globe, not just for Malaysians. Have you had to pivot uh, Zafigo, its overall direction? How have you had to approach it differently over the last, what, 15 ish months? Well, definitely, you know, I mean, we had to be careful uh, because talking about travel at a time when people are stuck uh, seemed insensitive. So we did change our tone a bit. We started talking about what you can do uh, while at home, what you can learn and how you can travel kind of online. But we also realized that people need dreams they need inspiration. Mm. They want to aspire to something. So we still talk about travel. We still show on our social media uh, photos of beautiful places saying, when we open up, this is where we can go, you know, because I think it's very important to, you know, give people hope because otherwise, you know, if you say, oh, it's going to be endless, you can't go anywhere. And, you know, it's so sad. It's very depressing. So we've, we've pivoted in our content in that way. We also used to have on-the-ground events uh, where we had, you know, a lot of women gathering and hearing the stories of women who've had all these travel adventures and everything. So we've had to move online with that. And we have something called Hello Zafigo where we talk to very interesting women about various issues, some related to travel, some not. And we also started a podcast on books uh, where we travel through books and talk about, you know, different places that are featured in books or different people writing in different countries, that sort of thing. So, yeah, right. we've, we've, like everyone else, we've had to pivot. Uh, true. I hope you started with On the Road, Jack Correct. That was something which I had to grow up with reading in school as well. And that always gets me... <laughs> In the mood for travel, that's a traveling book at its core. Uh, can when, when, when everything opens up, and again, this is important and everybody gets a vaccine, I want to stress that anyone watching right now, I've got my appointment book and I shake my fist to any of the anti-vaxxers out there because I want to travel. But how do you think, how do you think everything's going to change in how we travel? How is it going to be different, do you suspect? It's impossible to say precisely, but what do you expect moving forward when we are allowed to cross borders? Well, I think safety will become a major, major issue, much more so than the last safety scare that we had, which was 9-11 and 201, where we were subjected to x-rays and, and things like that. But now it's really going to be end-to-end -end how safe are we going to be. And that's going to be determined by whether we're vaccinated what are the rules, whether there are going to be quarantine rules, you know, from this end to the other end. You know, it's, it's one thing you can leave here safely, but on the other side, what is going to happen there? Um, and that's an ever-evolving thing. We, we are still not clear about how uh, things are going to be. I mean, there are places like Phuket and Bali that are wanting to open because tourism is so important to them. But we're still unclear about the rules. And, mm. and, you know, it just takes one case and things change immediately. Mm. So, yeah, um, it, it's going to be very different. Um, it's something that we're going to have to constantly be updating ourselves. I think it will be a long while before we get to anywhere near um, the way we used to be. But that happens to be also, this happens to also be good for the environment, you know, if we don't travel as much as well. So I think we have to be conscious about that. But the other thing that is going to make our decisions more difficult is cost. I really think that airfares are going to be more expensive and they can't help it, We, you know, because that's the way it has to be. And uh we're going to have to make our decisions based on that as well. So maybe more domestic travel, more regional travel, rather than wanting to, you know, do our long haul and, and go to all the usual places. Yeah, it's, well, Malaysia has a lot of beautiful places themselves. My grandma was from Sitiawan Perak. I used to go to 
to Qatar to see some of her relatives there. My dad was living in Labuan for so many years and, and KK and Penang. Just Malaysia itself is beautiful. Um, Absolutely. But it's, it's interesting also how Singapore have just announced. Again, everything is subject to change. Anything we're talking about right now could be different tomorrow because it's ever evolving. Totally, uh, totally. And um, they, it, yeah, just looking at Singapore and how they've uh, tried to, to pivot in terms of Climatizing to the new normal, but it's based on their population getting vaccinated. Again, that is so, so key. But yeah. what does a new normal mean to you? When I say the phrase, the term new normal, what do you think of? I honestly don't know because last year's new normal is quite different from this year's new normal. I mean, last year in June, which is when my birthday uh, was, I could actually go out and have dinner I have a birthday dinner out and we had two tables of four and, you know, a bit apart from each other, but we were still out there. This year, I couldn't do it. This Last year, Hari Raya, I could visit my parents with masks and we didn't come close. We couldn't hug and kiss, but we could see them in person. This year, we can't. So, you know, even the new normal is undefinable. Uh, mm. right now, except that it is it means restrictions and limitations and and this is the thing you know what what we need is an idea of when these restrictions will go because I don't think human beings can stay confined for long without you know some sort of reaction and i'm I'm <laughs> I'm really afraid of what the reaction will be. We It goes on for too long. Yeah. Whilst we try to make the most of our time on the lockdown, have you picked up any new skills? Did you learn anything new? Do you even have time for something like that? I know you're an exceptionally busy uh, individual, um, but did you did you happen to make some time to learn a new skill? Of course. <laughs> like everyone else, I learned how to bake. Oh, okay. I learned how to make cakes. Um... I brushed up on my Japanese mm -hmm. with online courses. I, I did some online writing courses. I discovered podcasts uh, to listen to. Um, yeah. And I, you started, started your own as well? Let's not forget. I started, I started my own as well, talking about books. So I'm learning a lot of new technology. I'm learning about microphones and webcams and... Things like that, uh, which is which is great. Um, so, yeah, I, I have picked up uh, quite a bit, um, trying to make the best use of my time. And I've also been writing my book. So, yeah, I have a book that's supposed to come up at the end of this year. So I've been busy writing that and now in the editing process and mm. researching photos, etc., I read it. It's a memoir due out in November. So are we still sticking to November or maybe a December? That's what, what my publisher says. They want it out in November because apparently that's the best time to release a book because then people will buy it for Christmas maybe. Mm. Um, mm. But it is a very tight deadline, you know, because most people, they get about two years to, to submit a manuscript and I just had a few months. But it's something to do, and I guess it's one thing uh, that the lockdown is good for. I can't do anything else, so I might as well. Spill your secret, though. What is the Marina baking special? What, what, what are you most proud of when you bake, since you said that's a skill you picked up? Um, I could make a burnt cheesecake. <laughs> Tasty. Which, which I couldn't believe I could do. <laughs> Um, I also made this, uh, what was it? It was an, like an upside down banana cheesecake or something. It, it can't remember the exact name, but it looked good. And I did it a couple of times. It worked every time. So the only thing I haven't quite succeeded in is making bread. Okay. Yeah. I know the feeling. I kind of, I was on a similar path as you <laughs> over the past 15 months or so. Um, I'm just about out of time, but I got one last question to ask you. If you had to give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh gosh. Uh, that was a long time ago for me. <laughs> 
but you've had children now and you you must have looked at them and thought about advice you would give yourself as well um i think i would tell myself to be a bit more street smart i i think i i wasn't i was quite a sheltered a child. So there were a lot of things that I was really naive about uh, when I went abroad, you know, when I went to study and things. And I, I still sort of think of some of those moments and I blush um, <laughs> with embarrassment. So I think just sort of being, you know, savvy and alert, alert to things around you is, is a useful skill for an 18 year old. Mm. But that's asking a lot, I think. <laughs> Life experiences, I guess, uh, and you grow as you get older. That's that's the beauty of being a human being. Uh, Dr. Buduka, Rina Mahadev, thank you so much for joining me here today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Very enlightening. Sure, and it, it's, uh, it's great to see all the work you've done. That's why it's a privilege for me to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We'll speak to you again soon. All the best. Thank you.